Should we be checking more for vitamin D deficiency in hospitalized patients? Is there any evidence that supplementation can reduce COPD exacerbations? And should every patient with a history of seizure disorder be on vitamin D supplementation? I'm very excited to share this topic with you guys today because recently I've been checking for vitamin D deficiency more often, and it's very satisfying to find it and then to replace it, just like when you're checking for iron deficiency and replacing iron. And not only that, it's, it's actually a pretty big deal, not only for osteoporosis or people with CKD, but also people with COPD and with seizure disorders. So while checking for something so simple may seem like, you know, such a low yield thing, it's also just so easy to replace their vitamin D and actually provide some pretty meaningful clinical benefit that has good evidence behind it. So I made this dot phrase of vitamin D deficiency. And so obviously what we check is the 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. And so what exactly is the threshold for when we are supposed to treat vitamin D deficiency? And the answer to that is we're trying to reach a goal of 20 to 40. So if they're less than 20, then that's when we would start treatment. Now, there's two thresholds that we kind of look at. So if they're severely deficient uh, of less than 12, then we need to do more aggressive replacement. And we also have to assess for other potential etiologies of their severe vitamin D deficiency. For example, if they have some malabsorptive process. So it's recommended to check their calcium, FOS, alkaline phosphatase, and PTH uh, to evaluate for secondary hyperparathyroidism, and anti-TTG to rule out celiac disease. And this is all because, you know, these patients are at severe risk for osteomalacia and osteoporosis, and it's a little bit harder to be that deficient, uh, and so you need to really rule out other potential causes. And if they're at that severe of a deficiency, then we would start with 50,000 units of ergocalciferol every week for six to eight weeks, followed by 800 units of vitamin D2 or D3 daily after that uh, if their level is less than 12. So what is the difference between D2 and D3? So D2 is ergocalciferol and D3 is colocalciferol. And actually the evidence shows that D3 is superior for replacing uh, level vitamin D levels more quickly and uh, having better absorption overall. The reason that my dot phrase says to do ergocalciferol first is mainly because that's what's on the formulary at my hospital uh, to get that 50,000 unit dose. Uh, you, know, that's, you know, that's just what we have available. But if you have cal colocalciferol uh, available, that's actually favored. So here you can see that uh, ergocalciferol is found in plant-sourced foods, mushrooms, and things like that, and it's possibly lower quality. Whereas D3 is animal-based. It's produced in the skin when exposed to sunlight, and it's better at improving the vitamin D status. Now, if their level is a little bit more in the moderate range, what we would call vitamin D insufficiency, uh, that would be when their vitamin D level is 12 to 20. In this case, we would start 800 to 1,000 units of vitamin D3, ideally, uh, every day, and then repeat their vitamin D levels in three to four months. So what about the evidence for reducing COPD exacerbations and why every patient with a seizure disorder should be on vitamin D supplementation? So there was a large meta-analysis uh, that was done in COPD patients, and it said it did not reduce the rate of moderate to severe COPD exacerbations overall, but a subgroup analysis revealed protective effects in patients with a vitamin D level of less than 10. There were no increase in adverse events noted in this vitamin D supplementation group. But there's actually a lot more evidence uh, than just that meta-analysis that's listed in UpToDate. So the efficacy of vitamin D therapy for patients with COPD, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. And remember that pyramid of evidence? Uh, a meta-analysis of RCTs is the literal highest um, you know, form of evidence that we can have. And in their meta-analysis, we found that vitamin D used in COPD can improve lung function, including FEV1, FEV1 over FEC, and six-minute walk distance, and reduce the acute exacerbation, sputum, and CAT score. That sounds pretty strong, right? And we've got multiple other studies showing that vitamin D supplementation has significant effect in reducing number of acute exacerbation in COPD patients when given for a prolonged period. And then another meta-analysis of vitamin D to prevent exacerbations of COPD, vitamin D supplementation safely and substantially reduce the rate of moderate severe COPD uh, exacerbations in patients with baseline 25 OH Fox vitamin D levels less than 25, but not in those with higher levels. So we've got a lot of studies showing some pretty good uh, you know, results here. 
Now, moving on to patients with seizure disorders. Anytime you see a patient with a seizure disorder, they should essentially all be started on vitamin D supplementation. So if you don't see them on it, you should start it. The reason is a lot of the anti-epileptics that are used, such as phenytoin and carbamazepine, are CYP450 inducers, and they actually reduce the uh, amount of vitamin D available. It just kind of metabolizes all the vitamin D in the body. And so you become very vitamin D deficient and it leads to an increased risk of osteoporosis and osteomalacia and, and bone disease. Even in patients who are not on those anti-epileptics, you know, eventually in the future, they may switch to, you know, from Keppra to carbamazepine, for example. And there's also a lot of evidence that many patients with seizure disorders are baseline deficient in vitamin D. So here it's recommended that for patients receiving anti-seizure medications, we suggest calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Although the optimal intake has not been clearly established, the age group-based reference intake for calcium and 800 units of vitamin D daily are the typical use doses used. Finally, I also want to remind you guys that uh, multiple sclerosis is another neurologic condition that uh, is associated with low levels of vitamin D. And while vitamin D supplementation has not really been shown to improve um, or reduce flares of multiple sclerosis, I think because these patients are vitamin D and the fact that it's a low risk intervention, uh, it's definitely warranted in my opinion to replace the vitamin D. Who knows what other conditions are actually impacted by low vitamin D levels. So by checking for your patient's vitamin D, giving them supplementation when indicated, you are preventing skeletal complications, osteoporosis, reducing the risk of COPD, improving their response to anti-seizure medicine therapy and their ability to tolerate it. And overall, it's such an easy intervention to make, especially when patients are already hospitalized for other reasons. Let me know down in the comments if you are going to start checking vitamin D levels in your patients more frequently. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.